all black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back. Welcome to this episode of season 12 of Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are honored today to be joined by Professor Moria Bailey, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Communication Studies at Northwestern University. She's the author, co-author of Hashtag Activism, Networks of Race and Gender Justice, published by MIT Press in 2020 with co-authors Sarah J. Jackson and Brooke Foucault-Wells. And of the just published, Massage Noir Transform, Black Women's Digital Resistance, published by New York University Press 2021. Of Massage Noir Transform, Kathy Cohen writes, it is an important Black queer feminist text that implores us to think differently and expansively about Black women, resistance and power in the 21st century. How are you doing today, Professor I'm, Bailey? I'm doing pretty good. I'm glad to be here. Uh, well, we're glad to have you here. Um, it is an amazing book that I think in some ways is just uh, one marker of, of what has already been a pretty extraordinary career, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at, as a scholar and even as an activist. Um, so, you know, we're glad to have you in the space to talk about this important new book. Um, one of the things that struck me very early in the book is, you know, when you talk about your travels to this book, you know, that you began writing this book uh, as uh, an undergraduate student in Spelman, um, and specifically an undergraduate student who is being nurtured and framed within the field of women's studies. Talk a little bit about that experience as it has continued to inform your work, how important that space was, at an HBCU at like Spelman and some of the great scholars that you worked with that kind of put you forward on this path. Yes, well, I'm so glad we're starting there because that's also how I met you was through, yes. <laughs> through that early work. So I was a junior at Spelman College, president of the Feminist Majority Leadership Alliance. And in the process, we had a particular action around Nellie coming to campus. And one of the things that's been so interesting reflecting on that time was that we were a relatively small group of students who just wanted to ask a couple of questions. I think our naivete was not, uh, was not fully recognized by Nellie's team or by the press that took the story afterwards. I think we really thought we could just, you know, write a letter and have a conversation <laughs> about the representations and music videos and the kind of lyrics artists were producing. And we had been politicized through our actions and organizing on campus, facilitated by professors like Beverly Guy Sheftal, Imbahati Kaumba. And those experiences really shaped us and gave us a sense of hey, we can say something, we can talk back to the way we are being represented and framed. And that particular experience was so eye-opening in terms of how Black people, Black women particularly, are treated in public spaces, even by other Black people. So we learned early on that you know, the radio may or may not be our friends in terms of how people choose to portray us and to portray our actions and organizing in response to that. So that experience really got me thinking about how Black women are represented in all forms of media and got me started down this path of thinking not just about music, but also just representations in popular culture and what is the impact for Black women, which is how I got connected to that wonderful moment of hip hop journalism, yeah. Uh, yeah. hip hop feminism, that uh, I think people that I really miss <laughs> as a moment where we were thinking critically about the music that we loved and was the soundtrack of our lives. And I think that shifted a little bit today. Yeah, it's it, it it was a particularly heady moment, and and I like this idea that what was so unique about that moment is that the criticism of hip hop was not divorced from hip hop, right? The criticism of hip hop was hip hop in and of itself, right? It wasn't coming from elsewhere, right? It was critiques that were coming from within for people who cared about the music, 
Right. Absolutely. And what the music could do in the world at the same time being hypercritical of the kind of images that were circulating, representation that were circulating in the music. I mean, it's, it's the irony that you bring up early in the book about the campaign around Nelly, how Nelly was actually using his platform, right, to talk about issues that affect Black women's health that are undervalued, right? But he didn't see, right, the, the interesting dichotomy there of of exploiting black women's images in order to be able to have a platform to be able to do that work absolutely i mean that is i think the greatest irony of all of this the people who have power a lot of the people who are in a position to make images and representation got there through creating some really caustic and troublesome representations but now they're in a position to redefine or tell a different narrative you're barely, your class of 2005 at Spelman, so, so you're barely out of your undergraduate education, right? Oh Beginning goodness. your graduate career. <laughs> and, 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 and you come up with this word. Um, and, and, and again, it's, it's important to be able to, to do a kind of trace back to this moment because Facebook is still not really, you know, Facebook's still a thing that college students have access to, right? The, the larger public hasn't gravitated there. Um, there may or may not be a Twitter, <laughs> no. you know, in, yeah. in this moment. Yeah, YouTube is a relatively brand new phenomenon at, yeah. at, at this moment. So to create this word that would become, be used to continuously frame the representations of Black women in popular culture for the next decade and beyond, I mean, was that anything that you were considering when you talked about this word, massage noir? No. <laughs> I wrote it in the dissertation for the dissertation. And it was one post when we started writing for Crunk Feminist Collective, when that came about, I used it in one post and then other members of the collective started to use it. And then it spread to other bloggers, other writers online. And I talk a lot about Trudy as being particularly instrumental in mm -hmm. the words proliferation online. So Trudy had a blog called Gradient Lair and talked about a bunch of different things, but started to really theorize massage noir in different contexts. And I think that's part of how the word spread. And one of the things that I say when I think about massage noir is that I don't think it would have moved in the same way if I had written it from the perspective of being in the academy. I think yeah. if I had just yeah. been uh, a professor already, I don't know that it would have moved in the same yeah. way that it moved uh, because of that moment and being somebody who was interested in having these conversations publicly on blogs, uh, in the internet, social, media platforms that were available to me at the time. So it's been an interesting thing to watch the word circulate both in online spaces, digital spaces outside of the academy, and then to see it taken up again in the academy. Yeah. You know, community is something that comes up time and time again in this book and in your work generally. Um, you talk about those early days at Spelman, you know, with the feminist group, but also being in women's studies classes, right? The, the Women's Resource Center at, at Spelman, which at the time was one of the few, if the only, you know, women's studies spaces at, at HBCUs. And, and then you're able to link with the Crunk Feminist Collective. And I think it's so important to remember the work that that collective did. That there's a way in which I, you know, when some of this stuff rolls out today, you know, in social media, I, I almost wish that we could transport, you know, <laughs> what the Crunk Feminist Collective was in 2011 to this moment to yeah. do that kind of critical work, because the kind of critical work that, that you did as a collective is really missing in the way that we talk about popular culture, and particularly the representations of women in it at this moment. Yeah, thank you for that. I've been thinking about this a lot. And I had a conversation when I was uh, promoting the book with Mariam Kaba about how Black women have been represented in this moment and how kind of the change in social media from having friends or relationships with people online to a culture of following has really yeah. shifted the way that yeah. we engage in online spaces. Yeah. So in those crunk feminist days, I mean, we'd get like 100, 200 comments on a post in terms of people going back and forth and having a conversation with 
what had been written. And now people follow. And so people might repost, reblog, but that culture of following, following is right. very different from right. a culture where people are engaged in having a conversation. So I think that's really shaped this current moment in a new way in terms of how people engage and think about what's happening in online spaces. As I read through the book, you know, the, the metaphor that began to strike me, because uh, we were all drawn to social media, um, the kind of work that was done around the, the Gina 6, um, the earthquake in Haiti, um, obviously, you know, the, the Trayvon Martin Black Lives Matter moment, you know, all of us are drawn to these spaces, you know, Twitter most prominently to be able to do a certain kind of progressive activism and progressive scholarship. But, you know, in reading through the kind of traumatic experiences that Black women can experience, you know, on social media, it feels like a bait and switch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like the very thing that you go to, to, to empower yourself and communities becomes the very place where you're disempowered. And constantly reminded by that is as we deal with these, you know, the circulation of these caricatures of, of Black womanness. Yes, and, and Mark, I think that's true in so many of the media forms that Black people have access to. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about music, I'm thinking about um, athletics, like there are so many spaces where Black people are empowered by something that is also fundamentally shaped in a way that makes them the, the loser in some way. You know, um, we are in a position where Black people have such small, narrow ways to move through and get access to resources and entertainment, sports, you know, those are some of the primary outlets through which we have access. But even through that access, we're seeing a narrative that still shapes us in ways that we don't like and don't care for. And I do think there's got to be um, some reclamation. And part of what I think about with the book is that social media has allowed us to reclaim some of these spaces that were not designed for us mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to repurpose them into ways that are actually part of us sharing and telling our own narrative. So I really think about some of the YouTube videos that I talk about in the, the web series that people have been able to create or the tumblers and hashtags that people use, give people a chance to challenge a narrative and also not even directly think about that narrative per se, but give people the opportunity to create what it is that they wanna see when the representations generally are so problematic. I, I was struck, you know, you talked about titling the book and, and not wanting to leave it as misogynoir, right? That, that, that transformed had to be there because you didn't want to just do a study of the harm, right? You, you wanted to be able to document some of the pushback and some of the resistance. And in some ways, you know, the resistance comes from places that we might think of then as unlikely. Yeah. So Black tra trans women, right, taking advantage of this new medium to be able to push back, um, you know, folks like Janet Mock and also talk a little bit about the activism of, of some Black trans women around what was happening in terms of representations of Black women in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I feel like Janet Mock was so instrumental. And it's it's interesting to think about Janet Mock now as, you know, the superstar director of Pose, mm -hmm. uh, an acclaimed series. But at this time, Janet was uh, not as well known, was a mm -hmm. writer uh, for Marie Claire. And after that experience of coming out and telling her story, she really started down this path of, trying to align with and connect with other trans women. And she created the hashtag girls like us to bring attention to one particular case of injustice. But then the hashtag itself grew into a space where trans women from all over the world were able to connect and create a network that cool. otherwise wouldn't have been there. And it's led to all kinds of other flourishing and possibilities. And one of the stories that she tells is that Angelica Ross and Jen Richards, two trans women 
who we now see as famous actresses, actually met through the hashtag and started to develop their web series, her story through that connection that the hashtag created. So I just think of that as one really beautiful example of how people are reimagining what Twitter can be and what Twitter can do, and that it opened up so many more possibilities than I'm sure anybody at Twitter was ever thinking about. Yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned the work that was done around the, the free CC hashtag, right? And it turns to CC McDonald, right? And, and how many folks were unaware of that case, if not for the hashtag activism that was taking place at that moment? Absolutely. And I think free CC is such a beautiful example of how people are able to make connections to communities that they might not see themselves as a part of or connected to. So an example I give in the book is this infographic that somebody created comparing CeCe's treatment to George Zimmerman, to the treatment of a Black woman also in Florida who was accused who wasn't able to actually use the stand your ground, um, right. stand your ground um, precedent in right. terms of her own case. And so it allows people to see how we're being treated differently based on some of these identity markers that then translate into disparate oppressive yeah. treatment in our society. You talk about this longer history of Black men who are complicit in these problematic representations of Black women, right? It's, and it's actually just to sit there and read through and think about Flip Wilson's Geraldine, to Martin Lawrence's Shanae, to, to Jamie Foxx's Wanda, to then, of course, Tyler Perry in Medea. And, and in some ways, those are complicities that we have come to expect right, and they have been right, rightfully critiqued, but, but then you name others, right, and specifically Lena Waite, you know, which, which has to give people, you know, reasons to pause to think about, you know, how important the circulation of representations of Black women are on the minds of folks who are invested in creating images, right, and in the case of Lena Waite, right, you know, she can make the claim, this was early in my career, and I was just trying to, you know, to, to get into the industry, but again, it it's, lets loose something that she doesn't have the ability to control or bring back. Absolutely. And I think that language that was early in my career, this was something I was doing then, speaks to this pattern of using Black women, using negative representations of Black women mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. bolster and move somebody's career up. So I really think that that's a, you know, a telling story of how Black women can serve as these building blocks or stepping stones for other people, uh, even as they're being harmed in the process. And when I think about those Black male comedians, you know, I'm also really thinking about this moment we're in right now with Dave Chappelle's special on Netflix and the reaction to his consistent and kind of even going deeper into his transphobia in terms of trying to explain away this particular representation. And what's interesting to me here is that Dave made a point to say that he didn't want to be a man in a dress, that he felt like that was something that he had seen other Black comedians have to do. And that was something that he himself resisted. Uh, but then to see him double down and triple down on his portrayal of trans people as somehow extra trans women as being um, overly sensitive to his comedy is to miss the point, which I think mm -hmm. I try to underscore in the book that if the joke is about somebody's embodiment, if the joke is about who someone is as a person, then what's actually the comedy there? Like what is the, what are we right. supposed to be laughing at? And, right. and to me, that just, I don't know, takes us into this new realm where we've got to think more carefully about what it is that we hope to accomplish with our art and where we hope that art actually uh, lands and lands with who. You're obviously, you know, deep in the weeds around uh, 
digital activism, right? First, you know, with with uh, this book, obviously, and also hashtag activism. And, you know, to go back to earlier, this early moment in your career with this attempt to hold Nelly uh, accountable, right? And, and, and folks might miss this now in 2021, because, you know, Nelly isn't necessarily hot shit. It. Um, but you know, Nelly is at the top of the pop charts then, right? You know, and so to even be able to bring attention to him at that moment was something extraordinary, right? But now we're in this kind of moment where it 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 feels more difficult to hold people accountable as the mechanisms to hold people accountable are much more expansive. Absolutely. Right. And so we, we talk about this kind of dynamic over and over again about cancel culture, right? So it's it's easy to perform the canceling of somebody. But the actual cancelization doesn't actually occur. Right? <laughs> it does not. It does not. And and I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Mark, because one of the early gifts that you gave me was the idea of thinking about, you know, a care package for some yeah. of these men. <laughs> like, how do we actually get to a point where we can ask them or give them the tools to maybe think about their situations yeah. differently? And in those early days at the CFC, we created a care package for Chris Brown with some readings and some mm-hmm. videos mm-hmm. and some suggestions of things he might want to look into. And of course, you know, we have no way of telling who that reached. Um, right. Clearly, right. it didn't reach Chris. <laughs> but I wonder what kind of accountability might still be possible for some of these uh, men who in so many cases are also survivors of violence and and victims of sexual violence themselves. So trying to think through what does our social justice practice look like Mm -hmm. that is moving us out of policing, moving us into abolition, while we are trying to acknowledge the harms that people have caused, but also understanding that that harm likely co- comes from harm itself. You know, I, I, I talk about, I talk to Treva Lindsay about this often about uh, black women scholars who do work deep in the archives and elsewhere around black women's trauma and, and how you do that work and not carry that trauma with you, right? To be able to divorce yourself from that trauma, even as you go back into it, to be able to create the kind of, you know, ref- necessary critical reflections on, on what's happening. Um, and so that, you know, for I, I wonder, you know, as you're thinking about where we are in terms of activism, hashtag activism and activism generally in the digital space and otherwise, um, what are the things that are keeping you up at night these yes. days? <laughs> yes, and I appreciate that. I just saw something recently about, <laughs> you know, how people are responding to, critical race theory in K through 12 education and this idea that this legal scholarship is somehow infiltrating our schools. Uh, One parent was saying that her son had nightmares after reading Beloved. And it just became something that I was like, your son should have nightmares after reading (laughs) Beloved. Like, Like there is something about the trauma that we have endured that I'm not necessarily interested in getting rid of or desensitizing people to, uh, but we do need practices and strategies for for dealing with that in a way, carrying that, uh, Mm -hmm. not to ignore it and not to downplay it, but what are our strategies for survival as we negotiate it? And one of mine, has been uh, trying to get into, well, I've, I've been meditating for a long time, but um, one of the things that I do is these uh, salt water floating things, mm-hmm. which apparently um, Steph Curry is also doing. So I feel like I'm in the <laughs> right community in terms of, I'm, I'm on the cutting edge as it were, in terms of of floating, but um, <laughs> that's one of the things that helps me when I am up late at night thinking about just what's happening with the digital world that we live in, both in terms of the negative content that exists on the web, but also 
all of the human rights abuses that happen to create this digital infrastructure. I've been thinking a lot about uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Congolese children that do a lot of the mining of the minerals that power our digital devices. And, you know, Black kids are the ones who are creating the, or gathering the resources that make our digital connection possible. And they're being exploited in that process. And then of course, there are all of the other people who are exploited along the way in the digital supply chain. So my practice now as somebody who's doing digital work is trying to think through what choices am I making and how does that then impact the digital work that I'm producing and making sure that there's some connection between my research on the digital and also my research into what's happening with the digital infrastructure that supports yeah. my research. What's next for you, Professor Bailey? Ooh, I mean, I feel like <laughs> what's next is hopefully figuring out how to be in this world in as ethical way as possible, creating as little harm as possible, and, and bringing other people along the way. I'm newly uh, having graduate students, and so that is, <laughs> I don't know, a very difficult ethical question for me. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that with as, as much grace as possible. <laughs> Yeah. Any well, tips you have would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me just say this before uh, we let you go. Uh, you know, you're one of those few people that I've had the honor to watch grow up in the academy. Um, and so just on that level, it, it's like really extraordinary and wonderful to see the scholar that you've become. Um, secondarily, you know, for you to give a shout out to your dad, who I met when I was a graduate student, <laughs> right, at a conference who, who just cut a certain kind of vision of how to carry myself as a Black man in the academy that I always appreciated. And I remember telling that to you some years, that, you know, when you told me who your father yeah. was, and it was like, wow, that's pretty extraordinary. Um, so please do give a shout out to him and also oh, our, friends up at, our, our friends up in Evanston. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. We've been joined today in this season 12 episode of Left to Black with Professor Moya Bailey, who's the associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies at Northwestern University. She's the co-author of Hashtag Activism, Networks of Race and Gender Justice by MIT Press with Sarah J. Jackson and Brooke Foucault-Wells, and of the just published Misogynoir, Transform Black Women's Digital Resistance, published by New York University Press 2021. We are label mates. Um, again, <laughs> congratulations on this wonderful book, boy. Thank you so much. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back, black.